Today, Pranabha is leading. Pranabha, if you haven't met him, which most of you have, has been sharing the teachers of Yogananda and Swami Kriyananda for 26 years. He and his wife, Parvati, have helped establish several of the Ananda centers and communities in Seattle, Portland, Palo Alto, and Dallas. He's held numerous roles over the years. He's been director of the yoga teacher training program, manager of the Expanding Light, manager of the retreat center in Assisi, and he's also directed the membership training program at Ananda Village. He now manages Ananda Sangha, Sangha Worldwide, Ananda's outreach ministry. Just, in and your own consciousness, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Guru, Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we humbly bow before Thee. Unite our love with Thy divine love. Unite our lives with Thy expanding joy. Unite our awareness with Thy cosmic consciousness. Guide us to be Thy instruments, to share Thy blessings with the world around us. Om Peace. Amen. Life is a dream, time like a stream, carries our burdens away. Never despair, joys everywhere, love can befriend you today. Free from all colored birds on the Soar above griefs and worries, seek joy and be gay. Often on earth, things of great worth, worldly ambitions define. Sometimes a friend helps us ascend up from life's cares to the sky. Love is a star, a shining afar. It can guide us and help us for light to draw nigh. Sing with me. Life is a dream, time like a stream, carries our burdens away. Never despair, joys everywhere, love can befriend you today. Free from all colored like birds on the air, soar above griefs and worries, seek joy and be gay. So I invite each of you now to join in and chanting the Mahamritam Jaya Mantra. And we'll, David will put it up on the chat box in a moment here, the words to it, because I think most of us are familiar with it. At Ananda, we use both the Gayatri Mantra and the Mahamritam Jaya Mantra, as you will tomorrow morning with the recording of Swamiji. 
pretty much for our fire ceremonies on Sunday mornings or at other times during the week. And the, the focus there is to really be purified and to release the things that prevent us from being who we are. So the Gayatri Mantra, we use clarified butter ghee to represent our heart's devotion to be purified into the flames of God's love. And for the Mahamricham Jaya Mantra, we use grains of rice to toss into the flames to be purified, to release the seeds of karma. And typically when we use the Mahamricham Jaya Mantra for the fire ceremony, we end with the, the, the vibration of Swaha. Swaha, as we know, is the inner self, the deeper true self of who we are. And as we uh, toss those grains of rice, we're releasing any obstacles to the true self, Swaha. But normally, the Maharmicham Jaya Mantra is repeated without the Swaha, because that's really applied to the fire ceremony. But not to confuse us, we'll just continue doing the Swaha as we repeat this seven times this morning. I don't want to put you into a, a tailspin of confusion about that. But generally, traditionally, because the Maharmicham Jaya Mantra is from the Rig Veda, the oldest Veda, and it talks about um, I don't know if David, if you can put the words up, uh, we can see the English translation from the physical perspective, along with the spiritual eye. And so the three eyes are brought together into that oneness of divine vision. And we worship that one of divine vision who nourishes all beings. May he free us from death and grant us immortality. So because of the vibration of this mantra, it's used in many yogic traditions throughout the world as a potent, very powerful healing mantra. And so that's why I chose it today to be a part of our workshop, to really bring that vibration that we from our center, our oneness in that oneness of vision of complete unity, that we can bring that healing vibration not only to ourselves, but to the world around us. That's of course in sore, it's sorely in need of this vibration. So feel more than anything else, the vibration of the mantra and tune into the rhythm of the mantra. So I'm gonna chant it maybe a little bit slower than Swamiji chants it on the recording that we use and we will use tomorrow morning for our fire ceremony. So just tune into that. But let's just chant Om three times to get into the vibration of Om first before we actually do the mantra, the Mahamchitraya mantra seven times. So just close your eyes if they're not closed already. Feel centered, sit upright. And let's just chant Om three times deep and deeper and deeper. Om. Together, let's chant the Marmicham Jaya Mantra seven times. Om Triambakam Yajamahe Sukandi Pushtivardhanam Purva Rukkame Vabandhanam Mrityor Mokshi Amritat Swaha Om 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 so let's take that now into meditation. So again, make sure you're sitting upright, your eyes are closed, you're feeling the power of that mantra, both releasing the devotion of your heart and bringing that omnipresence to your awareness at the kudasta, the spiritual eye, the point between the eyebrows. You can feel 
the rhythmic breath flowing evenly in and out and tune into your self offering. We're just going to meditate for about five or so moments. So make this more of a meditation of absorption and self offering, continuing the vibration from that Mahamricham Jaya mantra. Release yourself completely with all your love, all your devotion, all your awareness. Oh, peace. Amen. So it's wonderful to be with all of you. It looks like we've got a little over 40 of us gathered together. And uh, as you know, this is the online version of the original weekend retreat up in Connecticut that Gyan Dave and I were going to lead for you. So it's a great pleasure to be able to do this and to share this with you. And I was just thinking at the end of the meditation, I recall when I was doing some programs for Ananda, Michigan in Lansing, and it was in December, and uh, I, uh, one of the people need to um, fix their Christmas tree stand, so we went to a hardware store, and the hardware store was playing one of these oldies but goodies, you know, radio stations. And as we walked in, the uh, refrains from My Sweet Lord came on, you know, George Harrison's popular hit, My Sweet Lord. And at the beginning, the, the refrain comes in, Alleluia, Alleluia. And then we were in the store for quite a long time, uh, picking up various things. And then suddenly the refrain changed to, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And then if, if you don't remember the song, it goes further and the refrain goes into the hymn of Brahma. Brahmanandam paramasukadam kevalam, and so forth. And it was just like, here we were in this setting that was very mundane, very much in the physical world, chanting God's name. And I thought, that's what happens to a lot of us if we just have that receptivity, that openness to possibilities. Um, you know, there is a, the illustration, the analogy that we... I've heard many times about either the glass is half full or it's half empty. Intriguing idea, isn't it? Um, just to say that I've met a number of people that have understood the glass half empty as being a very positive incentive. It was very interesting to see that they turned it around from what we would see as being maybe a negative connotation and saying, hey, it's a springboard for me to fill it up again. Um, so it's more of a sensitivity to what's going on that really allows us to see what's possible because the attitudes that we carry are vitally important to what can happen in our lives. It's not just that uh, life itself can impose its impositions, its restrictions, its um, challenges to us, and we have to abide by them. We always need to appreciate their real in their own level of reality, but we always have the capacity of finding joy in challenging times. You know, if you think of uh, our emotional uh, reactions that happens in our lives to situations where something may happen and we have an emotional program, well, the understanding from uh, medical science is that that emotion um, is there as a reality for us as an experience, but it has a lifespan of maybe 90 seconds, a minute and a half before its emotional program is gone through our system and it's released. Now, you and I, we all know that there are many times when we've had that emotional charge where it lasts not only 90 seconds, not only five minutes, but maybe the whole day. So what's happening there? Why is that a reality for us when the, the reality of what's happening in our internal structure, physiology-wise, is only 96 seconds long? It's because we have attached ourselves to the reactive process that is resultant from that. But it's our buying into that's, that's our reality rather than saying it's a reality moving through us. Now, that's an amazing shift of awareness that becomes a very, very practical tool 
not just a nice spiritual idea. And the more that we can create that relationship to what's going on in the life around us, then we can handle a lot more and not just cope because coping is uh, a survival mechanism that's very important for us. But if we rely on the coping mechanism for any length of time, we basically uh, fall back to that default position that's a degraded sense of who we are. It's a deterioration of who we are. It's meant to allow us to cope specifically with initial challenges to, and then we can you know, find the ways to cope with it. But unless we're able to move the energy past just coping, we tend to more and more default to that just coping status in our lives. And that doesn't allow us the scope or the meaningful sense of what life is about to be right with us in that time. So, you know, Master talked about a very interesting thing uh, at one point in one of his lectures, he talked about doubt. And he said a surprising thing about doubt, because I think we've all heard doubt is a deterrent for our spiritual growth. It's, it's an obstacle. And yet he said, if you look at doubt in another way, from another perspective, the doubt is necessary to grow spiritually. But he couched it in terms of what that doubt is. He said that negative doubt is that reactive process that traps us into old habits, into old patterns that really don't allow us to tune into what's trying to happen through us in that moment. But he said constructive doubt allows us not to presume on what's going on, but to have the, the buffer zone of perhaps not understanding something, but not negating it, not rejecting it, but saying like a, a spiritual scientist that we want to explore, what does this mean? How do we make this an experiment and bring the value into my own experience? Because if we just rely on belief, is what he said, then we can be led astray. I mean, you just look at some of the news items going on today about the COVID-19 coronavirus, and it's like, wow, what do you really know to be true? You know, it's just, wow, that's all I can say. Luckily here at the village, and some of you may have been able to get some notes, but Dr. Peter Van Houten, who of course is a medical doctor, uh, for us here at Ananda, and of course is a minister, Ananda minister in Kriyacharya. He's been given, giving us updates now three times a week uh, to explore what is going on and to weed through some of the, the stuff that's out there. And it's amazing because um, things pop up and they seem so full of energy and validity and suddenly they're not. And, you know, people are gauging life and death experiences on some of this information that's being released. And so we need to have, even for the scientists, to take a hypothesis, to have constructive doubt. And for us as spiritual scientists, that creates an awareness of we're moving towards our goal. Ultimately, that goal is oneness with the divine. We're having that possibility always there before us. So if we endeavor to always think we're moving directionally, then we can stop the reactor process of negative doubt, but open up the possibilities, engage it with the tools of introspection, of discernment, viveka, discernment. We're able to look at these things and more than just look at them, feel the integration and feel the experience as being more alive as our own experience. Now that's, that's amazing because it's very clear that the way that the brain works for us is that if we have optimism, it diminishes the pessimistic part of who we are. If we're more prone to being in that pessimistic experience of life, we diminish, we diminish optimism. 
it's just that way. It's, and the energy is moving. It's not a static position that I'm optimistic or pessimistic. I'm always moving in the spectrum of possibilities and the spectrum of experience. So, but if we move the, the needle on the dial towards always having openness and optimism, then that becomes the relationship we have to experiencing the world. It's not just putting on rose-colored glasses. I mean, that may be a starting point, maybe a very good starting point for people, but it actually creates a sensibility of what the world is for us. We start to feel and tune into the goodness that is in the world around us. Even when people aren't acting with goodness, we can feel and appreciate the goodness behind their display of maybe a negative behavior. Now that allows us a freedom that we're not being bounced around by life's conditions. As Master said, conditions are always neutral. It's how we relate to them that makes them a happy or unhappy experience. Now, I think a lot of us have been tested, even as devotees, during this time period with the COVID-19 coronavirus. There's no question it's had a dramatic impact. I mean, I was reading this article and thinking about this, that probably the greatest global impact that would be like this was World War II. We've had a lot of wars since then and other catastrophes, but in terms of the scope and impact, really World War II had the greatest global um, effect on, every, on the whole population. And I was thinking it brought back a memory when I was a young child, I was probably five years old, that my parents shared with myself and my siblings um, the story of their experience because they were, they're from Denmark, they were in Denmark in World War II when the country was run over very quickly by Germany and uh, martial law was imposed and there was just a very different life really within a few days time uh, for all my relatives. I have many relatives still in Denmark. But my parents were sharing with me what their experience was. I mean, my father was part of the underground and so there was always the um, lingering anxiety anticipation that a knock on the door wouldn't be something to look forward to. And uh, they were shared, they had an album of photos and some of them were horrific and they weren't sure they should have shown them to me because I was five years old of the experiences that were there at that time. But they, they talked about how they were able to join together. Um, you know, and work together, even under those just intense, uh, challenging conditions. And what I got out of it, even as a five-year-old, and maybe I matured in my understanding through the years, obviously, but that what I gained from it, it wasn't so much just about survival. It was catching a way to feel that life had real value that was always there in a positive way. Now that's real optimism in challenging conditions. And I think many, many, many people during this period we're in now have been able to draw upon that optimism and make it real as an experience and not just as a hope. Hope is just amazing for us, but isn't sufficient until we integrate it into our lives moment to moment. Because then we're, we have the surety of that experience not being something to be gained but something that is going to expand and grow. And when that is happening, we have the ability beyond even what we say, beyond even what we do, as we know as devotees, to affect people, to affect the globe, to let that vibration be the shining beacon of light. Even if we don't think we're a shining beacon of light, that light will be there in shining into the corners of darkness, shining into the veils of delusion that just wraps so intensely around people's lives. 
So it's just a, it's something that we can keep in mind that if we operate from the perspective of opening up to optimism, then we can shift whatever periods of pessimism we have and turn the corner and move the energy. But the energy is what's important in this, is that we can't just get away with thinking it's going to change. I remember years ago when I was doing a lot of programs in Southern California that um, I got invited to be on a cable TV show. And it was a half hour weekly show that this chiropractor had put together. And he was a fun, lively fellow. And the first thing he said to me, he said, I don't want you just to talk. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I want you to give more of your whole self into the experience. And um, so after we got the pancake makeup on for each of us, I thought to myself, so this doesn't, wasn't my plan to come into this studio to do what I'm suddenly feeling inspired to do. Uh, so I did the super conscious living exercises with him. And he just, he just loved it. He was like a, a child gleeful and joyful in the experience that someone actually brought something that he could feel as an experience. He had me do them three times in that half hour because he wanted to make sure the people viewing the show really got it and tuned into the experience. And I thought, yeah, that's what we need to have is tools that can make the shift. And so we need to have the ways to shift our attitude. We need to have the ways to shift our energy. We need to have the ways to shift our consciousness. And so these ways become more the in invitation and then the approach and then finally the integration so that we're one in, in those experiences. But when we change the way that we think, we start to also connect in with how we feel. And they're related, we know that. There's the body-mind connection, there's the heart-mind connection. And we know that if we can move towards something more constructive, then we start to diminish those emotional pulls that come on us. You know, the most um, well-known sutra of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is the second one, Yoga Chitta Vritti Narodha. Yoga is the neutralization of the whirlpools of feeling. Now, it is good to recognize that the sutra doesn't say yoga is the neutralization of feelings. And some people will read into it that way, that it's the neutralization of feelings. But no, feelings are a part of us that allow us to connect intuitively, to connect introspectively, to connect with our sense of feeling, uh, what the divine truth is and how that divine truth is real in our outer life. So it's, it's critical, but we want to neutralize those, um, the whirlpools, the rittis, um, the disturbances that take us away from being centered in ourselves. And so that's important that we find ways to do that. Now, it's not always that we're going to catch ourselves right away when we're caught by an emotional, charged, intense situation. Um, Hopefully we've been building up a lot of momentum. As I said, the more that we focus on optimism, the more that we focus on a positive magnetic vibration and experience that, we will diminish the tendencies to have the negative parts, the reactive parts, the emotional um, reactive situations happen. We're able to, in a sense, relieve ourselves of the tendencies, but they'll be there still until we become jivan muktas. It only, it only is safe when we arrive at that point of being liberated while living. Uh, there's still karma, as we know, when we become jivan muktas um, from the past, and that can be worked out in whatever way our souls feel attuned to doing it. But there's no post of ego to attach any more reactive process, any more ego possibilities to at that point. So we have to recognize that until we arrive at that point of that nirvikalpa samadhi and the jivan mukta status, hey, we're going to be tested. And the tests may be more subtle, but they'll probably be more intense from what the masters have said. And so what we want to do is make sure we've got 
constant daily moment to moment momentum that's magnetizing always the, the right solutions to grab the energy and move it towards where we want to go. Because it's said the way that the brain works, that if you have an attitude of compassion or of peace, and then you add in um, deeper breathing, you bring in relaxation and you bring in meditation, that it's said that just in a few months of just incorporating those things from someone who hasn't been doing those things, so it doesn't really apply to us, but it gives you a, a reference point, that it says that that person will be able to feel the strength within, they'll be able to feel its building, and they'll feel new neural circuits that are there available for solution orientation rather than problem orientation. So we start to shift into, wow, uh, what happens in life can be seen as a gift always, as Master said, opportunities rather than um, you know, there are no obstacles, there are only opportunities. So, but the challenge with us is, you know, you look around, you hear the news and um, you, you sense in many people, and perhaps you yourself, I've certainly felt it a little bit to some degree. Uh, you can feel fear, you can feel anxiety, um, you can feel the, the tendencies to uh, rebel, you know, to resist. Um, as Dr. Peter told us, there's a natural tendency of denial that comes in when your reality changes externally. And how you deal with a new reality is kind of blocked or at least veiled with denial. And so the challenge is, uh, how do we move the energy in a positive way? And so if, if we indulge, remember, in the reactive process of those emotions that are negative, like anxiety, fear, resistance, then we start to lose uh, the capacity for compassion and care. But if we invigorate, and that's a good word, to invigorate compassion and care, it starts to squeeze out the, the tendencies to be selfish or protective or defensive because there's a, a tying in with the unitive experience of super consciousness if we're doing things with a more expanded positive emphasis. And that becomes real. It's not just, yeah, I can feel that a little bit. It starts to be the norm of how we relate to the experience that's happening externally to us. What the intrusions of other people's reactor processes are don't really have an imposing impact anymore. They're real, we feel it, much like, you know, you can squeeze or pinch yourself real tightly and you'll feel that pain, but it's only because you're doing that to yourself. You can just relax and then feel, okay, I can release the pain part of it. I still will feel the pinch, but I'm not identifying it as painful or negative. And Swami always talked about going to the dentist and not taking Novocaine when he's having dental work, that he said he would uh, place in his awareness uh, either doing meditation like Hong Sa or he would mentally write a new piece of music or, you know, visualize something, whatever the tool that he was inspired to at the moment, he would use that as his focus point. Well, Maybe some of us haven't achieved that same experience with the dental uh, chair as Swami did, but probably some of us have experimented at different times. Um, I remember one time I had to go to an uh, oral surgeon uh, because I had this weird condition where uh, what they thought was a deterioration of the gum from gum disease. It was some weird thing that produced a sponge-like effect in my uh, gums that uh, couldn't hold up the roots of that particular one tooth. And so I had to have the tooth extracted. Now, typically dentists no longer extract teeth. I mean, they do to some degree and probably in rural areas like where Ananda is outside of Nevada City. But even back then, 10 years ago, our dentist sent me to an oral surgeon that specialized in this. And, um, you know, they, they, they just do an intense 
injection of Novocaine and I didn't, I didn't reject it. I thought now's not the time to experience uh, that pain too much. But uh, I could feel the impact of it and I could read the blood pressure monitor was up on a shelf where I could see it with my eyes as I looked up. And as there was, to pull the tooth out, because I have roots that, that curve at an angle at the bottom, it's typical for most of my teeth apparently. So it's been a problem. And so when they're pulling the tooth out, it took forever. And at first, you know, I started to sweat and I looked up at the blood pressure monitor and it was just spiking to about like 148, you know, and above that even. And I thought, ha, okay, this experience is real, but it's not real as my only experience. And so I closed my eyes and I simply started to do tune into Hung Song. And even after a few minutes, I happened to just peek up and it was down to like 122. And literally within maybe about 90 seconds, it had shifted down to that point. Well, you know, maybe in a situation like a dentist chair where we don't have a lot of intrusions, it's just that particular pain or experience. But we can transfer that experience into a broader, much more expanded reality of what we're doing in every moment of our lives. Because if love increases, then anger and being upset decreases. But if you allow anger to come in and let it grow, remember the 90 second situation thing. Anger may be an immediate reaction because your buttons are pushed in an expert way from someone or some you know, some trauma is there, some karma is there that just is really sensitive and that that emotional charge spikes. But again, after 90 seconds, a minute and a half, that's not your experience. It's you choosing to continue the experience that's happening. So we have that choice to really shift things around. But also when things go wrong, um, I think we all have experienced many times, if not almost infinite times, where our, te our tendency is to blame ourselves, um, to judge ourselves, to feel that we're not worthy. We start to have an increasing lack of self-esteem. We feel that, you know, I, I'm not trustworthy. I'm not worthy. I, I, you know, we judge ourselves. That can just be a real washout for us as human beings and especially for us as devotees all we need to do is realize our behavior probably isn't appropriate at times but we needn't attach ourselves that our identity is that behavior granted we shouldn't be feeling we're scot-free from something that we've got that get out of jail card uh, from monopoly but we do have the sense of this is something that I've experienced and it took on maybe my identification for me, but it's passing, it's passing. And the more that we can appreciate that and acknowledge that and integrate the experience of that that's just a behavioral thing, it needn't be the pattern I have to repeat again. Because if we can shift away from the patterns that seem to repeat themselves to block who we really are. No matter how much we say, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change, and it repeats itself. It's like doing Hong Song. Um, you know, I think for a lot of us, we've gained the experience of Hong Sa over the years, or even if it's new to you. Um, in the beginning, we, do Hong Sa and suddenly these thoughts come in and it's no longer Hong Sa, it's thinking about a million things in the space of a nanosecond. Um, and that can continue for more than a nanosecond. Um, and then we think, oh, wait a minute. That's right, I'm watching my breath with observing the breath with the mental sounds of Hong Sa. Well, the truth is, if you can always come back to that your reality is returning to that observation of the breath with the sounds of Hong Sa, you are victorious. You have gained victory in the jaws of death, 
of delusion. And that's sometimes hard to really feel real about. But if you have that attitude, that's why I like to say to myself, you know, if I've been drifting off on the, the different continents of the world or the different solar systems of the universe in my meditation, um, I'm going to end each technique with a real focus. So I've been drift, if I've been drifting during Hong Song, I'm going to end that experience of Hong Song with being right there, even if it's just for 30 seconds. And then if I'm going on to Korea, likewise. Um, but if I am drifting in Korea, I will say, okay, I'm going to do these last six or dozen Koreas with complete focus in that way. It could be the own technique. It could be energization, whatever it is. But to be there right with the experience so that you gain that victorious integration. And it's more than just a mental affirmation. It's an affirmation from your energy, from your consciousness that really is there for you. So it's an interesting way of looking at it. But let's do an experiential thing. Um, so I'm not just a talking head. So I want you to close your eyes. And this is just a nice way to gauge what's happening with energy when we're dealing with different states of emotion, maybe different states of awareness. I want you to feel more the energy around to think uh, about this. I want you to tune into the experience of grief. I want you to feel what grief is in terms of your energy, not just thinking about the experience, but feeling the experience of grief. Okay, let that go. And I want you to tune into the experience of the energy when you're tuning into joy. The experience of joy. What's happening with your energy? And let that go. And then probably an emotion that you've been feeling somewhat in the last month and a half frustration. Tune into the energy that's in that frustration, not just the thought about it, but the energy and frustration. What is it as an experience? Or perhaps what's happening with it? What direction? And let that go and tune into contentment. Feel the energy that's your experience of contentment. And release that. Let's do one more. Let's tune into anger. What's the feeling in anger? And quickly let that go. And tune into compassion. What's the energy in compassion? Okay. You don't have to release that one, but you can come, you can open your eyes, but retain that one with you. So you probably all could tune into, you're tuning into the barometer of what's happening, of gauging what's going in a real way for you in terms of your energy. So obviously, I think in the negative ones, the grief, the frustration, the anger, the energy is contractive, it's pulling down, it's heavy, um, it's bothersome, it can be disturbing, it's uncomfortable, um, but it's real. And so it's not that we're going to be numb to these experiences, but the question is, can we change things? And I hopefully, I'm not robbing Gandhi of anything that he's going to share tomorrow. So, <laughs> but what happens when we shift to uh, from grief to joy, when we shift from frustration to contentment, from anger to compassion, the energy is released. One, you can feel there's an opening, there's a lightness, there's a sense that it's filling you with uh, an expansiveness, an appreciation, something that you know to be the truth of who you are. Well, if we can just pay attention to these things, then we can relate to the world around us 
by, by paying attention to what is the energy level to begin with. So let's do another experiential um, part of this class. So close your eyes and think about this morning, uh, except for a handful of us, this morning was a long time ago um, that you woke up. But just think of the moment you woke up, not the second moment you woke up, but the moment you woke up and tune into the energy in that moment. Um, what is it more lethargic? Was it more kind of uh, energizing but with tension? Or was it energizing being calm? Okay, then shift to uh, eating breakfast. I don't eat breakfast anymore, so I don't relate to this one anymore, but just think of eating breakfast. Um, was it just on automatic with not a lot of energy? Was it intense? You need to get it into your body so you can move on with moving somewhere, going somewhere? Or was it calm and centered? Was it enjoyable that you were chewing each mouthful 30 times? What was the experience there? And then midday, focus on midday. Uh, it's often an interesting time, or you could look at mid-afternoon, either one, where our biorhythms start to maybe change and we um, start to feel if I don't have coffee, I'm not sure I'm gonna do well. So let's pretend we're not gonna deal with coffee, but just tune into the energy here. So what is the energy uh, at that point, uh, midday or mid-afternoon? is again, just your, your eyes are getting droopy, you're, you're losing that awareness of energy, or is it intense because you jacked up on caffeine or some other energy drink or whatever it might be? Or is it an energy that's allowing you to appreciate yourself deeper by, by being in that center awareness? So you can open your eyes. So again, the more that we can appreciate an awareness first. That's why, you know, Lahiri Mahashaya and Master emphasize introspection as being a key uh, uh, of the Bhagavad Gita uh, because it allows us to uh, continue and open up to possibilities that we can choose. Because without choice, uh, we're going to tend to default to habits that are ingrained. And habits can be positive, as we know, but typically, we can too often default to habits that uh, aren't productive for us, aren't a positive experience. So we want to use habit uh, sparingly at times, and we want to direct it to more of a conscious awareness, even if we use a habit. You know, um, Gyan Dave and I have had the joy, although not for the last number of years, of doing a number of workshops together on refining energization exercises. And it's been truthfully a real treat for me to share that with you, Gyande. Um, but one of the things that I found over the years is that uh, it's so easy to get into automatic. Uh, and one of the jokes that I like to say is that, you know, so you're doing the double breathing, you know, palm stretching, and then you go into the ankle rotation, and then you go into you know, tensing the calf and forearm. And there are times, and this happened just about six weeks ago, and Parvati was standing nearby. And uh, we don't do them in the same rhythm, and we start differently often, and we end differently. But she noticed I went from the, um, the anchor rotation to the hip rotation at the beginning of the energization exercises. And she said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, you know, you've got to do those other 37 or 36 as well. You don't get to do the hip rotation until after all those. But then perhaps you have at other times when, so you get to the end and you're doing the anchor rotation and you go into the calf and forearm and thigh and upper arm. You know, it's just like, whoa, where was I for those other ones, you know? And so sometimes I've, I've, I've looked at energization as so let me just perk up with, a different way. So sometimes I'll just do instead of three or five repetitions, just two repetitions because it forces me to be there more because I'm only just doing two. 
Sometimes I'll do five to seven repetitions to come at it from a different angle. So it's using habit as a base, but not relying on the default of habit, but re-energizing it so it's working in a positive way. So that's a, something to keep in mind that, you know, go through activities and be introspective. Uh, what the energy level is, not going on the assumption of what energy is, but what the experience is, and then make a choice to say, how do I shift this? So how do we shift? How do we shift from uh, an experience that's coming to us that's coming from uh, a tendency to respond in a certain way, a reactor process or whatever? How do we shift? How do we, how do we change that? So let's do another exercise and just tune into that. So close your eyes and tune into this understanding that conditions are neutral, um, but it's more how we relate to our choices that really gives us not only the experience, but the direction of opening up expansively. So tune into something as simple as rain, rainfall. And tune into, so in the past, you might have had a negative experience of that, especially when you were looking towards a day outing, which of course doesn't happen at this point in our lives with the coronavirus. But just to say, at some point in the future, we will have days when we can go out again, but that you had hoped to go out and play in the park or do something at the beach. And it's suddenly raining and the forecast wasn't for rain. So you have that negative reality. So what shifts it into a positive reality, that rain? And just think about it. So there's a lot of answers that could come that's refreshing. If you live here on the West Coast, um, we're in a drought again, uh, so it's a problem. So I think we're all very, very happy that it's whenever it rains to whatever degree, and the more the better. Um, so we are able to appreciate that. But it's just our choice. Remember, happiness isn't um, an absolute experience. It's the experience that we bring from our awareness into what's happening through us and in us, from life around us. So let's do another one. Think of, um, and this is probably real pertinent to a lot of us, our personal finances. Um, you know, a lot of us have been furloughed, we've lost our jobs, we've been decreased in our salary, a lot of th things have happened. So finances can seem pretty intimidating during these times. Um, and they are, but they don't have to be that experience we identify with. We can just acknowledge it and appreciate it. So even under these circumstances of tough financial pressures, what would be your choice in making it something positive? And again, I'm sure there's as many answers as there are participants, which I think there's over 40 of us um, this afternoon. You know, there are all sorts of key things that come up for us that we learn to, as Master said, have plain living and high thinking. You know, we're able to realize consumerism isn't really that rewarding for us. We realize that we can do things in a different way. We can um, make our own food more often. You know, they're all infinite number of answers that bring that positive highlight to us in that way. So let's look at the, the looming um, the experience that's there for us. And that's um, the extended lockdown that this nation, the world is facing. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us have awaken in the mornings thinking, this can't be going on still. I mean, I've done my bit, I've been patient. It can't be still going on, can it? And yeah, I mean, it could be several more months. It seems like eternity that we've done it already, but it's only been about seven weeks, six weeks. So, wow. So there's that reality in the world around us. And maybe it'll open up sooner than later. 
but you never know. So there's that reality, a very real impact from the world. And what's the negative experience? We start to feel depressed, frustrated. We don't have our freedom. We don't have our choices seemingly in our outer lives. So close your eyes and tune into, and you've probably been experiencing this. What's the positive side of this extended lockdown, this extended self-isolation? What's positive for you in that experience? Okay, you can open your eyes. And again, probably a multitude of possibilities are in our range of experiences. But, you know, it's a chance to refresh. It's a chance to feel more of our inner self. It's a chance to actually do more of our sadhana uh, or do parts of the sadhana that we haven't been emphasizing as much. Um, you know, interesting, in my own life, because I do the yoga asanas, yoga postures every day. And I do a set that takes me maybe 20, 25 minutes. And I change some of the asanas, um, you know. But lately it dawned on me that, again, I got into a little bit more of an automatic with how the mental affirmations that are suggested with the asanas are happening in my experience. So I thought, I'm going to tune into the affirmations on a deeper level. So... There are a number of them that really jumped out at me that I could feel just, wow, this is like a wave of blessing. One of them is Ardha Chandrasana, where you're standing and extending the arms up and you're stretching to one side. And the affirmation for Ardha Chandrasana is, strength and courage fill my body cells. And I thought, yay, that's, that's what I want to tune into more and more. And then I started tuning into Balasana, the child's pose, which is the first part of what Swami taught us, Sasamgasana, um, that you're just kneeling down and you're folding your upper body over your thighs and bring your head down either onto your folded arms or onto the floor. And it's just such a comforting, uh, deep affirmation. Um, I relaxed from outer involvement into my inner haven of peace. I relaxed from outer involvement into my inner haven of peace. I just feel like I'm soaking up in that haven of peace when I do that asana. It just feels nothing else can touch me in this experience. Um, and the same with uh, Paschimottanasana, the posture stretch where we're sitting in our, on our buttocks with our legs extended forth and we're stretching the upper body up and then over the thighs, bringing the hands and arms down to the feet or the legs. And the affirmation is, I am safe, I am sound. All good things come to me. They give me peace. I am safe. I am sound. All good things come to me. They give me peace. And then finally, the one that really just, I just really have been tuning into even more is Sarvangasana, the shoulder stand. Very simple affirmation. God's peace now floods my being. God's peace now floods my being. It just feels like I'm wrapped in an aura of that peace, being in that pose and coming out of the pose. And then I've tried to transfer those affirmations and the experience within those postures with the affirmations outside of my practice of the asanas, outside of the practice of the yoga postures, just into different experiences that I can really weave them into constructing that I can find joy in these challenging times. You know, when we have a reactive response, uh, we shouldn't feel, as I said, judgmental about that we've blown it. It's more, how soon can we recover ground to come into, in a sense, a proactive or a positive magnetic experience? You know, um, a common phrase that's used when something um, kind of surprising happening is, oh my God! Uh, some people say much more intense things that use four-letter words. But nevertheless, a lot of people express themselves with kind of a shock or surprise. Oh, my God. Well, look at those words. You can also respond, and you can tra train yourself to respond. 
oh my god it's like it changes from uh, a separation to an embrace that oh my god is an embrace of energy in the midst of the challenges you know the phrase that master used and the one that we've used a lot i think all of us individually as well as groups on a lot of zoom calls um, is master's phrase that we should remain unshaken amidst the crash of breaking worlds well there's a fair amount of crashing and breaking of worlds right now and but we can choose to move forward in the right way and so we can do this with really being conscious using our introspection using our intuition using our sense of appreciation and probably a tool that i feel we can emphasize a lot more and I think a lot of us used it, but we can just engage maybe in a more magnetic, maybe in a, uh, a broader way, in a more specific way, is offering. As we tune into offering ourselves into an expansive flow, then we really tune into grace. Because as we know from the yoga teachings and from what Master emphasized and what Swami emphasized and what we all emphasize, is that it is grace that really transforms us. What we're doing with our part, which takes up a lot of our time, a lot of our effort, or a lot of our focus, is very, very important. But it's there to create really the possibility of opening up. And so it is in that offering that we really can make tremendous magnetic changes, that the transformations in our lives are guaranteed. You know, as Master said about Kriya, you know, we use this phrase often in the Kriya initiations that um, Kriya and devotion, Kriya along with devotion, is like mathematics. It cannot fail. Well, that's true for every part of our lives, not just with Kriya. That if we can bring our focus with devotion, that if we can bring our willingness with devotion, that we can bring our self offering, our service, our seva, our caring for others, our compassion for others, with an offering to the divine, then so much more can happen. So much more grace can really flow through us and be transformative. I think the thing that is easy, easy to overlook, and I mentioned this earlier this afternoon, that when we can be in that flow, we forget about ourselves. Sometimes it's our self-involvement that produces the reactive process even more so. But when we become more self-centered in an expansive way, forgetfulness becomes more natural. We're not thinking about how this will work out for ourselves. We're not even thinking of how it will work out for others. We're just more in the flow of offering, of being in that grace and touching others because we're touched by it ourselves. And we're not judging that it should be touching other people. We're not concerned that our healing prayers will be effective in the way that we think they should be. Those healing prayers, I'm sure you, you had the experience this morning with Vivek and Tichalia, that it's more the sense of our offering allows that attunement, that flow of healing energy to be vibrant, to find its way because it has intelligence, it is conscious. It will find its way if we're working with it, opening up, offering ourselves. And if the recipient, recipient can also be open, then that's so much more powerful magnetism can be there as the integrated experience. But that's the real healing that happens. It isn't that we desire an outcome, that we want something to happen, because that's not divine will healing. Divine will healing is attunement, that offering, that connection, that integration of that experience. So let's really remember that all these things come together our energy, our awareness, our self-offering, our self-forgetfulness, and our attunement will allow us to be the fullness of who we are and let that fullness really bring joy in these challenging times. And so let's, um, let's go into, uh, Rachel will lead us in a chant, so we'll all be muted. We'll chant, Lord, I am thine, and then we'll have a pure... Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine. Lord, I am thine. 
am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Be thou mine, oh, be thou mine. Be thou mine, oh, be thou mine. I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. I am thine, I am thine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine, I am thine. Lord, I am thine, I am thine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. Be thou mine, O oh, be thou mine. I am thine, I am thine. Be thou mine, O oh, so let's feel that devotion awaken in the heart feel that being drawn up to the point between the eyebrows the spiritual eye the kudista and then rather repeating a prayer responsibly out loud or even to yourself, just tune in more to the feeling of your heart, being expansive and open. And whether that comes through with mental words or just remaining at the sense of feeling, just take a moment to tune into that. And then make sure your eyes are softly closed. Don't squeeze them, in fact, just make sure your whole face, your whole body 
is just deeply relax. But again, relaxing more, floating upward rather than sagging down. And we'll use a short and brief, brief version of Swamiji's Meditations on the Moonrise. So with your eyes closed, with your awareness focused, mentally watch the moon rise on a boundless lake. Feel that the calm sky has formed a single radiant drop of liquid peace. Be aware of the drop falling, striking the water. The ripples of peace spread outward in all directions soothing the dancing rhythms of your own thoughts. Wave on wave of peace spreads over you. Now mentally gaze upward. Release your mind from its watery heaviness. You are becoming the sky. The moon rays of your peace spread quietly over the heavens. You have no boundaries, no weight, no need to worry, struggle, or compete. You are the endless sky. The cool moonbeams of your peace and the infinite silence are now one. Let's meditate now for about six or seven minutes in silence. I remain centered in that inner experience of the divine touch and grace. Let's feel ourselves to be open instruments, allowing the healing power of the divine to flow through us without any obstacles, without any reservations, feeling ourselves in that blessing as we chant Om together out loud sharing the blessings out into the world, letting those blessings touch all who are receptive, that they may feel the comfort, the love, the compassion in their lives, that they may nurture this love in other lives as well. Let's rub our palms together, bring the focus into the hands. Let's raise the hands and chanting Om three times out loud. Oh. Thank you all for spending time together and a wonderful way to have satsang. God bless.